Okay, so I had a green light to move on. And I think we've got three minutes past uh, 12. So I will be, are you listening to me, Joanna? Say, yeah, okay. So I'm going to introduce Joanna. Joanna is a biomedical scientist in cellular pathology that graduated here in Portugal. But then to work, she left immediately to Spain and then to the UK. And in the UK, she actually joined the Francis Crick Institute and led the immunosochemistry and RNA scope lab. So it was with uh, great excitement that we welcomed Joanna in our histopathology platform uh, to join an incredible team that we already have. And we are very excited uh, to add this methodology that Joanne is going to present and others to our portfolio. So we are going, Joanne is going to present the, the, the whole thing. And in the end, or in the meantime, you can um, drop your questions in the chat or then ask them live in the end. Is that okay? Thank you so much, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tanya. Can you hear me? Cool. Uh, so, hello everyone. As Tanya said, uh, my name is Rana and I'm here today to talk about RNA scope. I will start by giving you a brief overview of the RNA scope and base scope assays work and then tell you about my experience uh, using these assays while working at the Francis Creek Institute and here at Chavano Research. Uh, as Tanya said, the talk will be followed by a Q&A session and I'll do my, my best to help you with your questions. RNA scope is an novel in situ hybridization technique for detection of target RNA within intact cells. It was launched in 2010 by ACD Bio that became part of Biotechni a few years ago. It represents a major advance in RNA in situ, giving you molecular detection with the morphological context. The technology relies on their probe design. Uh, with the binding of 20 double Z pairs of probes to amplify the target specific signals, but not the background noise. This technology um, overcomes the limitations in sensitivity and specificity of con conventional in situ, and also their time consuming and very complex uh, procedures. I'm not going to get into too much detail about the way the assays work, ACD's website is very comprehensive and has great webinars if you're interested in knowing more about this. So briefly, um, these, these reflections or cells are pretreated to unmask the target RNA and permeabilize the cells. And this allows the RNA scope probes to hybridize to the target RNA. Then the detection reagents amplify the hybridization signal with the sequential hybridization of amplifiers and label probes. In the end, you'll have a contact dot result, um, and each dot represents a single target RNA. Uh, you can visu visualize it under a microscope, and you can also quantify it if needed. The base scope assay uses the same technology as used in the RNA scope, but is further refined. In contrast to the RNA scope, which targets long no coding RNA and uh, mRNA sequences, greater than 300 uh, bases. The base scope enables the detection of shorter sequences and also exon junctions, splice variants, and point mutations, basically covering situations where you cannot use uh, the RNA scope. Because of the probe time strategy and the signal of amplification, these assays are highly sensitive and specific. Uh, allowing for single molecule detection and also being compatible with samples with partially degraded RNA. The RNA scope and base scope probes can be divided into two groups, the probes of interest and the control probes. The positive controls, the target housekeeping genes, give you an insight of the quality of the RNA in your tissue. And the negative controls um, that target the soil bacterium give you information about any non-specific binding. These probes are designed uh, for different species and they advertise their assays as universal. You can detect any gene in any species in any tissue. 
the, these probes have different formats, uh, C1 and C4, C1 to C4 if you're doing RNA scope, and C1 to C2 for base scope. These formats are uh, combined according with the type of assay you're using. So if you're using a single PIX assay, for instance, you need a C1 probe, you must have a C1 probe. If you're duplexing, you need C1 and 2. And for RNA scope, you can also multiplex up to four probes together. And for that, you'll need C1 to C4. Uh, and like, for instance, uh, the antibodies you use for immunohistochemistry, there is no need for probe optimization in this case. What you need is to optimize the different types of tissue you use. So you optimize the pretreatment conditions before performing your experiment. This is particularly important uh, for samples that are not prepared according to their uh, recommendations. On that note, lastly on this section, I just want to highlight how important it is to follow their specimen preparation advice. Um, so just in summary, if you're doing FFP samples, uh, fix them for no longer than 16 hours. Uh, no, sorry, for no less than 16 hours and no longer than 32 hours. In case you're doing fixed frozen, fix your samples for 24 hours. Cut your sections at the recommended thickness for your type of tissue and store them appropriately. However, keep in mind that it's always uh, better to uh, use fresh sections. So if you can, do that. Um, for FFP samples, also uh, only bake your slides when you're about to run the assay. And for fresh frozen, only fix the slides when you're about to start. Um, with all this said, the assays will likely work even if you overfix your slides or if you've cut your sections like a year ago. However, it will definitely be harder to optimize the conditions. Uh, this will make you spend more reagents and time, <clears throat> ultimately spending more money overall. <clears throat> Obviously, there will be cases in which you really can't control the pre-analytical uh, conditions, like if you're using archive tissue or if you're working with human samples in some cases. But when you can't control all the steps, uh, following their advice will just make your life um, easier. <clears throat> so at the trick, I was performing single plex, duplex, multiplex RNA scope, as well as uh, the base scope assays, both manual and automated. We were also providing RNA and protein co-detection for recent and thermogenic. There was also a group at the TRIC performing whole mount RNA scope, so that's a possibility as well. Um, in the next slide, so I'm going to show you a few examples of the cases I worked uh, on while I was working at the TRIC. I'm not going to explain any details behind the research um, of these images. Uh, I will instead focus on giving you technical tips from my experience working with the different assays. Some images are from published work, so if, you, if you're interested, you can always check the references I have on the slides. Let's start with some examples of the brown assay. Um, on the left, there's an example of how the positive and the negative control probes should look like. And then on the same tissue, uh, you have their probe of interest. On the Right, um, you can see the importance of having positive controls that show that your tissue has good RNA preservation. Here, in this case, it is especially important as you, as you can see in the first image on the, on the right, there is absence or low signal. Um, having a positive control shows you that there's nothing wrong with your sample, the RNA is there, you just have a negative result and it's a real result. Also, these results are from uh, tissue microarray slides. Uh, so not all cores from different, from different samples had the same RNA quality. Um, so we run the positive control and from the total of 28 cores, only the ones with good uh, control probe results were uh, then considered for the FD, FP77 analysis. Here on the first images, you have the absence of signal in the knockout tissue. And here's my first tip. If you want to see absence of the 
in, in knockout samples, make sure you mention that when you're asking your probes to be designed by ACD. Sometimes the probes are designed for sequences that are still present in your knockout gene, and then you would still have signal. So keep that in mind. The image in the middle uh, shows increased expression of their probe of interest, in this case in adenomas. Um, as, as I mentioned before, you can quantify this signal, so you can quantify these differences. On the right, you can also see differences in expression, in this case, two other genes between wild type and knockout animals. With the increase of demand, uh, I developed links between a group at the creek and ACD, getting the support needed to go ahead with automation. Uh, we already had a Ventana um, Discovery Ultra platform, uh, so we, we decided to use that one. These images uh, show the first round of optimization performed during the assay installation. Uh, in my opinion, these results were far from being good enough when compared with a strong signal I was getting with a manual assay. So after trying a few different um, rounds, we finally got a result that was at least comparable with the manual results. Strong, clear signal and great tissue preservation. Even though some projects were still done by hand after this optimization, most RNA scope was done on a machine. And this had a huge impact on the way our lab uh, offered this service, reducing the turnaround times and staff dependency, which apart from obviously benefiting our team, was also an advantage for the science at the Creek. For this project, as an example, we ended up receiving a huge number of samples. So it was really helpful to have the assay optimized on the automated platform. Also, roughly a year after this optimization, with again an increase of demand, we actually were able to justify getting a machine just to do RNA scope, and we bought a Lake of RX. And here you have an example of an optimization on the Lyca for a 12.5 embryo. In the top images, the tissue is really overdigested. I'm not sure if it's clear on your screen, but the nuclei are badly defined and uh, the, the, they show the artifact called ghost nuclei. Um, by reducing the protease step, I was able to get much better tissue preservation. I'm sure you can appreciate the decrease in the amount of signal uh, on, on the bottom images, um, which shows that there is a thin line between getting amazing signal but losing tissue preservation. So you need to find that balance. These images show you an example of the duplex assay, which uses red and teal colors. You can also duplex with base scope, but you cannot mix RNA scope and base scope probes, unfortunately. That's uh, asked very often. Uh, another tip, not only the red signal is alcohol sensitive, the teal signal is water sensitive. So it will not only disappear if you wash for too long in water, but also, for instance, if you by mistake mount your slides with an aqueous mounting medium, and you've guessed right, I've distracted with that before. And yes, my beautiful signal is really gone. So always make sure you double check all the reagents you're using. Here you can see examples of RNA and protein co-detection with red and blue chromogens. When performing IHC with the RNA scope and base scope assays, you must always perform the in situ first. You will need to adapt your uh, IHC protocol to the RNA scope assay, as this one should be changed to the bare minimum. Bare minimum. Um, meaning you won't be able to do, for instance, an antigen retrieval. You need to make your antibody work with the RNA scope pretreatment. If your antibody works really well for immunohistochemistry, it will probably work well for the RNA scope, otherwise you might have a problem. Also bear in mind that you have a protease step in the RNA scope uh, protocol, which means some of your protein will be gone. If needed, you can dilute the protease. However, as I said, try to play with the RNA, with IHC protocol first before changing anything major in the RNA scope one. Um, you basically have to find a balance between not losing your RNA scope signal and getting a good IHC result. There are plenty of antibodies that have already been optimized with the RNA scope assays. Even if you have an antibody already working for your IHC, 
it might be worth it to find an alternative in the literature that has been proved to work well with the RNA scope. You'll likely end up saving RNA scope reagents and like a lot of money. Um, here I'll give you two tips. First, it's hard to see code detection if using red and brown chromogens, especially if we're talking about very small dots. Um, so opt for uh, red and blue, for instance, if you can. Also, for tissues with an endogenous pigment, like skin, uh, it's highly recommended to use the red assay instead of the brown, as it might be difficult to differentiate the dots from the pigment, as you can see the, in, in the image in the middle. Um, my second tip is always use a selection of samples when you're optimizing, and always run control probes only until you finalize your optimization in order to save uh, the re re uh, reagents. Um, finally, ACD has recently launched an ancillary kit for RNA and protein co-detection. I haven't used this kit, but I believe it might be very useful for the more difficult uh, cases. Everything I said in the previous slide for immunohistochemistry applies for immunofluorescence. You can do immunofluorescence with the single plex assay as the red chromogen is out of fluorescent. So that's very helpful. Um, but you can also use the multiplex uh, fluorescent assays, of course. Um, in these images, you have their probe of interest in red and SMA in green. Here we have some examples of the base scope results, uh, in this case with a positive control probe on ovary, gut, and skin. It's possible to see a difference in the expression of this control probe in the different tissues. Um, and here's another tip, always choose the appropriate control probe for your tissue type. Uh, if you're researching the skin, uh, as you can see in the image in, on, the, on the right, this control probe is probably not ideal. Um, also, if you're expecting your probe of interest to have a low signal, don't choose an overexpressed control probe to do your optimization. Uh, you can also do immunofluorescence after base scope or immunochemistry. Here uh, you have, um, again, the red signal that is out of fluorescent uh, for the probe of interest. And in green, you have GFP. Finally, I have a few examples of the multiplex assay. Um, in this case, you have the positive and negative control probes on cells grown on sites. That is another application of these assays. Um, this protocol allows the detection of three target probes on the same uh, section. The multiplex version 2 assay allows detection of up uh, to four RNA targets. This assay is highly sensitive and has a significant signal boost provided by the background noise suppression of the RNA scope technology and also the, the, the amplification uh, TSA uh, strategy of the Aquaia Biosciences opals that are used for this assay. Um, this allows expanded applications such as fluorescent in situ on FFP samples. These images are actually from FFP uh, samples uh, using the multiplex version to assay. Note that in these two pictures, there, there is a difference in the level of expression of the control probe, which is uh, normal and you'll see very often, and that's okay. Um, finally, just uh, an example of a 7.5 embryo, also with a control probe, uh, detected with a multiplex version to assay, just to show that you can detect even very small uh, samples. You can use very small samples with these assays. We recently introduced, like Tanya said, the RNA scope assays here at Champalimo Research. Um, so what kind of services are we offering? Um, we're happy to discuss your projects uh, before you buy any reagents. We're offering all RNA scope and base scope manual assays for different types of samples and also uh, for uh, RNA and protein co-detection. We can also provide training if you'd like to learn how to perform the assays and we're more than happy to help you troubleshoot your results. This applies for all the assays I mentioned today in my talk, as well as the new assays ACD has released in the meantime including the RNA scope hyplex, where you can detect up to 12 probes on the same section, and also their newest edition, the DNA scope. We are working on purchasing an automated platform to run RNA scope, and so we're hopefully 
be able to offer that service soon as well. The last images I'm going to show you today are the first RNA scope results from Enrique Vega French Group here at Champalmo Research. Um, and a Hashtairo, whom I assisted with training, has performed the assays and kindly allowed me to show you her results. Um, so Anna came to me with two technical questions. First, would her endogenous fluorescence survive the assay? Second, would she be able to image the sites before running the RNA scope assay, just in case her signal was gone? So regarding the endogenous signal, it depends. Uh, some proteins do survive, others don't. So it would be a matter of running a test about imaging the site. As you can imagine, it would imply changing the protocol. So my advice was run two serial sections in parallel, uh, the original protocol and the one stopping to image the slides so, we, so that we can check if there's any impact on the RNA scope signal. Comparing the results, it's obvious the site Anna has imaged has not only less intense signal, but it also seems to have fewer dots, as you can see on the image on the left. Um, the control probe signal was still satisfactory, so she decided to go ahead. And um, this is uh, her first result with her probe of interest, um, which made her very happy. Uh, so in the end, even though her endogenous fluorescence was actually gone, she was very happy with the result. Um, to uh, recover her, her signal, she would have to either image the slides before running the protocol, like she did with the trial, and risk losing some of her signal, or an alternative, run an immunofluorescence following the RNA scope assay, which would also imply some optimization. Um, however, they were so pleased with the results that they have decided to slightly change their strategy and buy a probe to detect this original EWAS signal with RNA scope. So that's it. I hope I was able to show you that RNA scope works really well and gives amazing results. Uh, it is, in fact, very expensive, but apart from working well, uh, it follows smoothly, it gives you quick results. Um, I'll finish this talk by summarizing the advice I always give to the researchers that come to me to discuss RNA scope. So first, careful planning is the key to not spend money on reagents that you will either end up not using or that will expire before you actually use them. And as I said, we're talking about very expensive reagents. Secondly, follow ACD's recommendations exactly, also or especially for the pre-analytical steps. These assays were developed following these recommendations, so they will work better and faster if you follow them as well. Also, if you have any issues and you contact ACD, the first question they always ask is, how did you prepare your samples? The second question they always ask is, did you run your controls? I know it might seem tempting to skip this step, but the controls do give you valuable information. So always run them for each new sample you um, test. If you have all you need before starting the protocol and also uh, make sure you have a way of imaging your sites if you're running the fluorescent assays. Follow the protocol to the letter. Unless, for instance, you're running a planned trial like Anna Hester was doing. Um, and plan your day prioritizing your RNA scope run. Don't incubate the reagents for longer or let your sections dry, for instance. Um, to avoid any possible errors, make sure you're concentrating and uh, it might be helpful to have a checklist of all the steps and tick them as you go. Some protocols have quite long and repetitive protocols, so I always found very helpful to do that. These are my golden rules. I hope you find them helpful. I came to realize during these past years uh, doing RNA scope that when these rules are followed, my life on the bench is much, much easier. So hope you find them uh, helpful for you as well. Before finishing my talk, I just want to highlight my previous lab at the Francis Crick Institute, the Experimentalist of Pathology STP, and also all the research groups from which projects I showed you images today, a fraction of the groups I collaborated with at the Crick. As you know, I'm now part of the Pathology platform, Action Palimo, and I hope Enrique Vega Fernandes Group is only the first of many, many more we will help develop our scope projects. Finally, just a 
quick highlights to ACD host and Oika Biosystems. Uh, they've played a key role on my development over the past few years, especially ACD, uh, but all of them have amazing customer support, so I'm very grateful. Finally, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take your questions.